financial accountability. All of us, individually and corporately, should have a system of accountability to help us maintain our financial commitments to God's work. Here's Gene. I've called this principle financial uh, accountability. And as we go into this passage, you're going to see that the Apostle Paul practiced this principle in a remarkable way with the Corinthians. And we're going to see that as we go uh, through this passage. Um, as you'll recall, Titus brought a report when he met Paul in Macedonia. There were good aspects of the report, but one of the aspects of that report was that they had neglected to follow through on commitments that they had made in relationship to this special project. And as we look at what happened, we see here that Paul developed a very strategic plan, and I want you to keep that in mind because it's significant that we understand that there was a plan, a strategic plan. And we want to look at that plan as it applied uh, to the Corinthians. There are four aspects to the plan. First of all, Paul sent Titus to help them complete what they had promised. 2 Corinthians 8.6, I think, is very specific in terms of illustrating uh, this observation. When Paul wrote, So we urged Titus that just as he had begun, so he should also complete among you this act of grace. In other words, what Paul is saying here in the letter that he's writing is that Titus has come, he was with you, he's reported to me, and I'm going to send him back. And one of the reasons I'm going to send him back is to help you be accountable to what you committed to in terms of this special project. So that was really the first point in that strategic plan. The second point is that Paul wrote a personal letter encouraging them to finish the task. That personal letter is 2 Corinthians. This is the letter. And so he says in that letter, in verses 10 and 11, chapter 8, and in this matter I am giving advice because it is profitable for you who begin last year, not only do something, but also to want to do it. Now when he says last year, we're not sure of the total time frame. But some time before, as a result of Paul being there twice, uh, they began this plan of setting aside money for this special project. So Paul goes on to say, now also finish the task, so that just as there was a nigger desire, there may also be a completion according to what you have. Now, with that little phrase, what you have, he is simply saying, you have neglected to do what you said you were going to do in relationship to setting it aside on a weekly basis, and I know what happened. You spent it, and you didn't set it aside. And so what I'm telling you is, don't be concerned about that. Begin now. Start now. Some of you can't go back and make it up because you've already spent it. The important thing is you begin now. And that's a very important point. You know, as I think in terms of my own situation and in, in my life with my wife, that there are times when we've gotten behind in what we committed. One of the reasons was that we had unusual situations that came up. Now, fortunately, in our culture and in our situation, we were able to go back and make it up. But not everybody can go back and make it up. And so Paul is being sensitive in this particular situation. So here's the second point in accountability. He sent the letter, the letter that we're studying. Then number three, Paul sent two brothers with Titus to make sure that the Corinthians had collected the money before he, Paul, arrived. Now, we've noticed what he said about these two brothers earlier, as we've studied, and um, they're anonymous, they're not named, but Paul said they're coming. And one of the reasons they're coming, accountability. So he says, 
in chapter 9, verse 3. But I'm sending the brothers so that our boasting about you in this matter would not prove empty and so that you would be ready just as I said. In essence, Paul is saying, I've been boasting about you. And it's affected other Christians. And they're doing what you supposedly were doing. But I don't want to be embarrassed, and you don't want to be embarrassed uh, when we come because uh, you haven't planned and you haven't followed through. So I'm sending the two brothers, in addition to the letter I'm writing, and in addition to Titus coming, I've outlined this plan, the strategic plan, so that you'll follow through. And that's very significant. This, this concept is very significant when you go on to look at the next, the fourth observation here. Paul alerted the Corinthians regarding his personal plans to arrive with some Macedonian Christians so that they would be prepared and no one would be embarrassed. I don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to be embarrassed. And we don't want to disillusion the Macedonians because the fact is they became generous even giving out of poverty because they heard about you guys and what you were doing. And so Paul is just being very open and very honest. Second Corinthians 9, 4 and 5, we read, Otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, you all, it's plural, would be put to shame in that situation or embarrassed. That's what he's talking about. Therefore, I considered it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance the generous gift you promised. Powerful statement uh, from the Apostle Paul in terms of uh, accountability. Now, it's very important, of course, as I've already illustrated, is that the Corinthians had become a model to the Macedonians. We read about that in chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, the Corinthian example. For I know your eagerness, and I boast about you to the Macedonians. And here's the quote. Achaia has been ready since last year. And when he uses the word Achaia, that refers to the area where the Corinthians live. Corinth was in Achaia. Uh, Athens was in a Achaia. The Macedonians involved going further north into that territory that involved the Philippians and the Bereans and the Thessalonians. But what he simply said, Paul said to the Macedonians, wow, in Achaia, the Corinthians have been ready. And then he says, your zeal has stirred up most of them. So he said, we don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to be embarrassed. And so I've developed this strategic plan. Now, in terms of application, I think we can certainly say that what Paul did illustrates the importance of accountability for all believers, all of us. This is a unique situation. It involves a unique project. But I think there are observations here and principles that certainly relate to all of us. And most of us who love the Lord, for example, in our lives, you know, we hear of a need, we get excited about it, but if we don't have some system of accountability, it's easy to forget. It's just easy to set that aside, especially in the world in which we live. So, like the Corinthians, it's easy to forget our commitments and to follow through. By the way, um, let me just simply make one other observation before we look at the uh, reflection and response question. This strategic plan, as we've seen, involves sending Titus, writing a letter, sending the brothers, and then Paul personally coming. And you remember I underscored the importance of a strategic plan. If you ever met a Christian who said, well, well, I give as the Lord leads. I give when the Spirit moves. Hello? I've done that myself. Boy, it's amazing 
how you can interpret the Lord's leading and not leading. Now, what I'm simply saying is that that's a very subjective statement. And certainly the Lord leads us to do certain things at certain times in special ways in terms of giving. My wife and I have experienced that. But generally speaking, it doesn't work. We need a strategic plan. And so you see the balance there between the divine and the human. And Paul certainly lays this out very clearly. It's important to have accountability. Now, the reflection response question is, what are some appropriate ways spiritual leaders in our churches today can help us be accountable? And the first thing that comes to mind in, as I think about that is biblical teaching. <laughs> what we're trying to do this evening as we look at these principles and this guideline that God has given us. God has outlined very clearly, even though this is a specific project, I think the principles emerge that apply to all situations, wherever we are in whatever situation we are, any place in the world. And so we need biblical teaching without apology, without manipulation, and that's a very fine line between uh, motivation and ma manipulation. And I think Paul outlines motivation, not manipulation. He's just stating the facts in this particular situation. Now, I think we also have to be sensitive to the fact that there are Christians who have been manipulated. We'll talk about that in another principle, but they're very shy about any teaching on money because they've been taken advantage of. And I think we have to be sensitive to that. And we need to help them to understand that because someone mistreated them or manipulated them, that does not eliminate what God says from the Word of God. And we need to be sensitive to that. And then secondly, I think in terms of applying this principle, we need personal accountability um, in our situations, in our lives, whatever those situations are. Um, I know within our own family situation, I'm very fortunate in the sense that uh, my wife handles all of the giving checks and what we give, although I'm involved in that, but I know I know that those checks will be written. I know that that money will be given, and it will be given regularly and proportionally, and that's a great series of comfort to have someone you're accountable to or someone who is accountable in the situation. Whatever our situation is, we need some type of personal accountability, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you, Elaine, for your part in this. By the way, those of you online, that's my wife. <laughs> and then, um, also, I think one final point in relationship to this question of appropriate ways we can help people be accountable is simply to let them know that we're thankful for what they're doing. We're thankful for their participation. And in our culture, saying thank you. We have that possibility. We can send receipts. We can say, thank you, thank you. And by the way, there are some people that say, oh, wait a minute. Giving is supposed to be anonymous because the right hand shouldn't let the left hand know what it's doing. And that's impossible, by the way, that illustration. Jesus used it. In the same verse, he said, when you pray, go into your closet and pray and don't let anyone see you. Did he mean you couldn't pray publicly? Obviously not. What he is saying to the Pharisees, the only reason you give and the only reason you pray is to be seen of men. That's what he's dealing with, their motives and their hearts. We have beautiful illustrations of a man like Barnabas who gave in a way that the apostles were so thrilled that they put his name in the Bible and changed it to son of encouragement, Barnabas. And for 2,000 years we know who Barnabas is and the beautiful illustration of his generosity. We need those illustrations, and we also need other people who can help us be accountable to encourage us by simply saying, thank you. 
So here's the principle that grows from this passage. All of us, individually and corporately, should have a system of accountability to help us maintain our financial commitments to God's work.